And the rains came down and the floods came up, but the house of that wise man stood strong. And what an incredible parable that is. It really helps us to understand the importance of putting to practice the words that we hear. And we think about these two men, they both heard the word of God, right? They both heard the word. They both endured a storm. Only one of them put the word to practice, and he survived the storm. We don't want to be like the foolish man. And so we have to recognize that there is going to be resistance in our heart when we hear the word of God. Maybe when you come to hear the word of God, all of a sudden you're super tired. And, you know, you're sitting down and maybe you had a busy morning and maybe you didn't sleep good last night and your mind begins to drift and, you know, you kind of uh, travel to the land of Nod right there in your seat. And the word is going forth and you're fighting sleep and you know you shouldn't be and maybe it's embarrassing. You know, you wake up or somebody nudges you. Lord forbid the pastor calls you out. There's resistance in our heart to hearing the word of God. We, we need to recognize that. So let's, let's look at uh, some verses that kind of give context to uh, verses 21 through 25 this morning. Actually, we're going to look at a verse this morning that is usually taken out of its context. And uh, we're going to give a little enlightenment to that. Let's look at verse 18. In the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth so that we would be a kind of first fruits among his creatures. And so we see here that James is stating that the Lord is calling us to himself. He is bringing us to him, bringing us forth through the word of truth. So through the gospel, the word of God, we become alive. We become born again. And we become a kind of first fruits among his creatures. If we look at the next verse, he says, this you know. So what do we know? We know that God is bringing us forth by the word of truth, the gospel of his son. And he says, this you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear. And slow to speak. And slow to be angry. And, and that's the verse, right? I mean, we, we hear that verse kind of taken out of the context of hearing the word of God. And it's, it's a very practical verse. We could apply it in many ways, right? Apply this to my relationship with my wife. I should be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. That would be good for our relationship, right? I mean, those are good principles, but really this is connected to our disposition when we hear the word of God, that we should be quick to hear, that we should be slow to speak, slow to speak out against it or to argue with it and slow to become angry. And let's recognize that the word of God often provokes us. It is hard to hear. There are hard messages. Think about Jesus and him proclaiming himself and the kingdom of God and how men would pick up stones to stone him. Well, when we think about our disposition of the word. We're sitting here week in, week out. We hear the teaching, the proclamation from this very pulpit week in, week out. And maybe we should be thinking, what is required of us here? What does the Bible say we should be doing when we come and hear God's word? And I thought this would be a good section for us. You know, we often go through books of the Bible. Matt does an excellent job of teaching through books of the Bible. And we are blessed by his teaching. So I think this would be a great message for all of us. It was super helpful for me and convicting to me this week as I studied it. So I want this to be a help to us. What is required of us when we come and gather together and sit under the teaching of God's word? Well, the word of God requires us 
to prepare our hearts for the word of God. And this we see in verse 21. We are responsible to prepare to hear the word of God. Notice in verse 21, Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, in humility receive the word implanted, which is able to save your soul. And so we hear <clears throat> this command, right, to, to put aside. And really this just means to, to lay apart, to lay aside, to put off, to put off whatever it is in our hearts that is going to prevent us from humbly hearing the word of God, to respond to the word in the way that we ought to respond or to understand the word of God. Paul talks about some of these things in Ephesians and, and also in Colossians. In Colossians chapter 8, I'm sorry, chapter 3, verse 8, he says, But now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. That There is this old man that we must lay aside, those characteristics of that old person that we once were prior to coming to saving faith in Jesus Christ. And if you read further in chapter 3 in verse 16, he says, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. Paul talks about putting off and then putting on and preparing as we hear the word of God. But what are we to put off? If we notice here from our verse, he says, All filthiness and all that remains of wickedness. Again, we need to recognize that there is going to be resistance in our heart. And we need to prepare. We need to ready our heart to receive the word of God. We need to remember that in our flesh dwells no good thing. That there is a battle that is taking place even now as the word of God is being proclaimed and it's within our hearts. There is a battle between the flesh and the spirit. There is a battle of temptation. There's a battle for your mind. There's many things that distract us. So prior to sitting and hearing the word of God taught, we need to be dealing with anything that is in our hearts that would prevent that word from taking root. We need to put away. We need to put off, cast off, lay aside, lay down all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness. I think of the ceremonial cleansing of the high priest before he would enter into the Holy of Holies in the temple. And there was this washing and cleansing that he would partake of before he entered into the presence of God. In much the same way, we should do all that we can to purify our hearts so that we are ready to hear the word of God as it would be implanted in our hearts. And this is going to entail confession of sin an examination of my life, an examination of my heart. This is going to uh, entail taking my thoughts captive to the truth. It's going to entail praying and asking the Lord for help so that I can concentrate, that I can listen, that I can understand what is being taught so that I would be like the wise man who builds my house on the rock. So before a sower plants a seed, he must prepare the soil. We think about that. We think about farmers preparing the soil. He has to weed it. He has to till it. He wants to do everything he can so that that seed will be accepted in the soil and that it will take root and that it will produce fruit. Now the, the planter of the seed could just plant the seed in the soil. And maybe he doesn't necessarily do all the work of preparing the soil, but he's not going to get the yield that he would get unless he prepares that soil to uproot those things 
bitterness, unforgiveness, impurity, pride must be laid aside. And it's just a good time to think about that. To think of those things that are waging war in your own heart. To come ready to receive the word. To come ready and prepared with the heart that has been cleansed out. That you are ready to receive the teaching of God's word. Peter gives similar instructions in regards to the heart preparation necessary for hearing the word of God in 1 Peter chapter 2. In verses 1 and 2. Peter says, therefore, putting aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, like newborn babes, long for the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. Let's think about the structure of our services here at Sovereign Grace in the morning. When we gather together, there is a time before every teaching of God's Word where the Word that is taught is read aloud so that our minds could begin to think about it. And a prayer is offered up asking the Lord to help us and asking the Lord to do His work by His Spirit through the Word in our lives as we hear. And this is a great opportunity to further ready your hearts for God's Word. And so during those moments as we prepare to hear the Word of God proclaimed from the pulpit, and we read the Scripture together, and we listen to the prayer, we can participate in those prayers together that we would prepare our heart to receive the Word implanted. Also through the singing of the hymns. Even the offertory song. Let's think about the song that we just sang this morning, right? Speak, O Lord. A beautiful song that is put forth to prepare our hearts to hear the word of God. In it, it says, test our hearts and our attitudes in the radiance of your purity. Let's let that song be the song of our heart before we hear the good teaching of God's word as we sit and listen week in and week out. And so this is a good time really to ask yourself to, to kind of think about these things right now and to ask yourself if you've been making it a habit to prepare your own hearts before you hear the message of God's word. If you have, then continue in this. Continue in that, that crucial practice of readying your heart to hear the word of God. Humbling yourself before a holy God. Ridding your mind, your hearts of filthiness in all that remains of wickedness. If it isn't, let this be a time of constructive reproving. Let it be a time of correction to you. That this would change the course of how you come here week in and week out to hear the word of God, that you would make, make it your uh, ambition every week to examine your heart before you hear the word of God, because we have a responsibility to prepare our hearts to hear the word of God. So now let's look at how we are to receive the word. So we need to prepare our hearts to be ready to hear the word of God. Now, how are we to receive the word of God? Let's look at James 1, 21 again. He says, in humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. In humility, receive the word implanted. Now, the word receive here is the same word that was used for the Bereans in Acts 17, verse 11. And we all want to be like the Bereans, right? The Bereans were those that heard Paul's teaching and they searched the scriptures daily to see if what Paul was saying was true. And so in Acts 17, 11, it says, Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily, to see whether these things were so. 
And so the word receive carries the idea of welcoming, of welcoming. And so I want you to think about, you know, let's say you have a good friend that is traveling a far way to come to your house and you're ready for them. And they come to the door, they knock at the door. And the way that you would lovingly open up the door and welcome your friend into your home, that you've prepared for them to stay with you. Well, we are welcoming something here this morning. We are welcoming the Word of God. And notice that God's Word here is being described as an agricultural figure of a seed. And not just any seed, but a seed that is able to save your soul. If, if anything else, if this was the only thing that the Word of God was able to do, this should tell us we need to be ready for it, and we should humbly welcome it into our hearts. The Word of God is able to save your soul. Well, let's think about the good character of God's Word. What are we welcoming? We are welcoming a word that is good, is loving, is benevolent, is true. We are welcoming a word that is pure and right. The purpose of the word of God is to enlighten, to teach, to correct, to save. We know that the word of God is a living word, an active and living word that transforms our lives and it transforms our heart. It brings about change and sanctification. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of, of the heart. So we must welcome the teaching of God's word into our hearts, as one commentator has said, as an active working force in our lives. That this word is powerful, and this word cuts to the heart. It discerns our thinking and our actions and our desires, but it is constructive for the believer in Christ to change us, and to transform us. This, in many ways, is the most powerful thing that we will ever hear. The Word of God. Notice also that the Word is being implanted in us. That's interesting. Our hearts, being the good, rich, nutrient soil for the implanted seed of God's living and active word to take root. Many of you know me. You may know that uh, my wife and I have a garden. And, uh, you know, we started gardening about nine years ago and or so, maybe more now. I can't even count. But uh, we have a raised bed garden. And I love our soil. It's like this special soil, right, of compost and vermiculite and pe peat moss. And it's dark and it's rich and I, you know, move my hands around in the soil and it's, I work it, you know, and uh, every year I prepare it for planting seed and planting plants in, in that garden. And I know that when I plant that plant in the garden or I put that seed in the garden, that it's going to grow. It's going to grow because I work that soil and I'm excited to receive the word. I want you to think about your hearts. Your hearts are the soil for the implanted word of God. That's amazing to think about. The soil is made for the seed, the seed for the soil. Your heart was created to be the soil for God's word to be planted, for God's word to take root for God's word to grow and to spring up, right? Living water out of you to spring up and to bear fruit in your life. And the fruit would simply be the, 
the response to the word of God, the, the fruit of obedience to God's word that produces humility and produces love and sacrifice and devotion to God. This is a beautiful thing to consider that we're to receive the word of God and the word of God is implanted within us. That is amazing. And this is a, in striking contrast when we think about the way in which we are to receive the word of God. It's in striking contrast to verse 19 and 20. We're to receive it in humility, not anger. We're to receive it in meekness and humility, not in wickedness. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 66, verse 2. The Lord says, But to this one I will look, to him who is humble and contrite in spirit, and who trembles at my word. The one who is humble in spirit, and contrite and broken in spirit, and who trembles at the word of God. This is a man who values the word of God. This is a man who sees the authority of God's word. This is the man who connects the word of God to God and recognizes that he is required to respond and obey all that God would say. Well, John Calvin writes, hence it is that so few profit in the school of God because hardly one in a hundred renounces the stubbornness of his own spirit and gently submits to God. But almost all are conceited and refractory. But if we desire to be the living plantation of God, we must subdue our proud hearts and be humble and labor to become like lambs so as to suffer ourselves to be ruled and guided by our shepherd. That takes work. That takes preparation. That takes a mind that is ready and eager and longing to hear the word of God. I think of Job. Job said, I desire your word more than my necessary food. Think about as the deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul pants for you, O Lord. It's good when your heart is longing for the Word of God, desiring the Word of God. And oftentimes in our life, we have situations and circumstances that move us to have a desperate desire for God's Word. But I would that we would always have a desperate desire for God's Word. And that we would always humbly and wel welcome the, the word of the Lord implanted in our hearts. That we would change. And so let's prepare the soil of our hearts. Putting aside all filthiness. The abundance of wickedness that remains in the flesh. Humble ourselves. And in humility, welcome the good seed of God's implanted word that is able to save our souls. So again, this is a good time. It's a good time to think about this right now. To pause and consider the disposition and attitude of your hearts this very morning. Is your heart's disposition this morning one of indifference to God's word? Is it one of resistance to God, God's word? Is it one of hostility towards God's word? Or is it one of humility to God's word? We want to humble ourselves and receive the word implanted. And so we've looked at how we are to prepare for God's word and how to receive God's word. Now, finally, let's look to see how we are to respond to God's word. If we look at James 1, through 25, but prove yourselves doers of the word, not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of God's word and not a doer, 
He is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. The word here is prove. He says, prove yourselves doers of the word. And this is interesting as I was looking this word uh, up and really trying to understand its meaning. It's the same word that is used in John 1.14 that says the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So it's the same word became as that word prove here. And it carries the idea of being, to be born. It actually is a word that means born in the same way that we would prove ourselves to be doers of the word. So it speaks of a continual being as opposed to to something that we do from time to time. And I thought that was very interesting. There's a difference between playing piano, like me playing piano, and then Marlene being a pianist, right? There's a difference between me baking a, a cake and then, you know, Emerald baking a cake because he's a baker, right? Or me building something and being a builder, And this is ultimately what this word is saying, that we would prove ourselves to be doers of the word, not just every once in a while, but this would be our identity. We are doers of the word of God. Responding to the word of God by obeying it and putting it into practice is also a telltale sign, isn't it? This is the telltale sign of who the Christian is. This is not something that he does every once in a while. It's not something that he practices only when he hears a teaching that he likes or he enjoys. Or maybe it's a teaching that talks about something he's already very passionate about. But rather, each time he hears the word of God, he humbly submits to it. He prepares his heart for it, and he sets out to prove himself a doer of the word of God. Notice as well that being a doer of God's word is juxtaposed here with being a mere hearer of God's word. Verse 22, but prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers of the word who delude themselves. And the word for hearer here is a word that carries the idea of someone that would sit in on a class and audit the class, but they would not actually be a student of the class and they wouldn't be graded. As a matter of fact, when I went to Youngstown State University and I would sit in my classes and I remember from time to time there would be students in the class that wouldn't show up for the test, but they were there listening. And maybe they would take some notes, but they would listen, but they wouldn't be graded. And I come to find out that they were students that were auditing the class. They were auditing the class. They weren't responsible for the the assignments, and they never took the exams. Unfortunately, this is the attitude of many who sit and listen to weekly sermons. This is just another sermon. This is just what we do on Sunday. And maybe sitting here thinking of the litany of things that you have to accomplish when you get home. They're here. They hear the same word. They sit in the same seats. They really have no intentions at all to put to practice the word of God in their lives. They look the part, but they will never do the work. They will continue to hear, 
but they will never truly understand. This is a very, very alarming warning that you could hear the word of God week in and week out. And you could be as far away from God as Judas was. Friends, this is a a very scary warning that ought to wake us up. It ought to sober us up. This warning ought to be like smelling salts in our, in our nostrils, right? To wake us up. I don't want to be like this man. Jesus talked about people like this when his disciples asked him why he taught in parables. In Matthew 13, 14 through 15, he said, In their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled, which says, You will keep on hearing, but you will not understand. You will keep on seeing, but you will not perceive. For their heart, the heart of this people, has become dull. With their ears they scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise they would see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts in return, and I would heal them. Wow. Wow. So I think about these verses. I think about the grace of God. That we would hear the word. And all the opportunities that we would have week in and week out. I mean, isn't it difficult when you're talking to someone and they're not paying attention to you? I mean, don't you feel like, I'm done talking. You know. But how often does the Lord continue to pour out grace upon your ears to hear? And maybe many people in your life have lovingly come alongside of you to encourage you to get up and go and hear the good word of the Lord. Those are not your enemies. Those are your friends. And God is a gracious God. One thing we have to understand is that the hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord has made them both. And so maybe this morning you're sitting here listening and you're saying, that's me. I have little desire for the word of God. I often would rather sit and and nap through the sermon. There's no fire burning in my heart for the words that are being taught. I have no love for Christ. I have no intentions to go and practice what was taught. I often forget immediately what the sermon was about when I leave and go to my home. Maybe this test you find yourself failing. If that's you this morning, don't shy away from that. Pursue after the Lord. I have great news. I have great news. You can turn to Christ in faith. You can look to him and cry out to him. The word of God is able to save your soul through faith in Christ. The teaching of the word of God, the word of God tells me that I am a sinner and I am an enemy of God unless the Lord, through the gospel of his son, changes my heart. That's a supernatural change that comes only through faith in Jesus Christ. And if you find yourself slipping in your desire for him, you need to go to him. That's a smoke alarm that you can't ignore. Sometimes we'll be cooking, you know, and there's some smoke that'll come out of our oven and uh, it'll set the alarm off. But I know it's not really, the house isn't on fire. I know, it's okay. And, you know, I'll go and throw a little maybe wet washcloth over it and put the fan on, open the windows, you know. But if I'm sleeping and I hear that alarm go off, I'm not going to go get a washcloth or put the fan on because I want to go back to bed. I need to get up. I need to find the fire. I need to get the kids out. I need to get my wife out even the dog, right? I need to take action. And if that's you this morning, take action. 
don't go through the motions here of coming to church and just hearing the word, but never really intending to put it to practice in your life. Jesus once responded to a woman who yelled out to him in the crowd these words regarding his mother. While Jesus was saying these things in Luke eleven twenty eight. One woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts at which you nursed. And shockingly, Jesus says, on the contrary, blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. And that's powerful. But that's where we need to be. And we need to recognize that if this morning you're hearing this and you're passing the test, you say, I love the word of God. I cannot wait to be here. I love preparing my heart. This is helpful. I want the word to be planted in me. I want to bear fruit. Then you need to recognize this is all of grace, my friend. It's not because you're a better student. It's not because there's something better in you than the person next to you who's nodding off. It means that God has graciously saved you out of a compassionate, merciful, and loving, and kind intention. And you can give thanks to the Lord and continue to pursue after Him in His Word. We are blessed, not simply by hearing the Word. You're not blessed simply by hearing the Word. You are blessed when you do it. You're not a Christian because you simply come to church and hear the word of God. A Christian is one who comes and hears and humbles himself and loves Christ and seeks to put to practice the word that he hears. And like I said, there is a battle. If you're a Christian, there's a battle. Your flesh does not want you here. There's a million and five things that you could be out doing this morning, I'm sure. But as Christians, we come together and we hear the good teaching of God's word because we need reminded, we need to humble ourselves, and we want to be used of God as fellow workers in his kingdom to advance the kingdom of God, the gospel. Notice here uh, in the next verse that, um, in verse 22, but prove yourselves doers of the word, not merely hearers only who delude themselves. They, They delude themselves who hear and don't put it to practice. What are they doing? They're deluding themselves. And we think, what does that mean to, to delude myself? I mean, this is the idea of being self deceived. And that's scary. I mean, think about what Jesus said. Many will say to me, Lord, Lord, there's, there's many who are going to be self-deceived. They thought that they had entered in through the narrow gate. They thought that they were believers in Christ. They called him Lord. They did works in his name. And he will say, depart from me, I never knew you. Those who hear the word and are merely hearers, and they don't put it to practice, they delude themselves. They're self-deceived. John MacArthur speaks of a Scottish expression uh, that speaks of such false Christians as sermon tasters who never tasted the grace of God. Sermon tasters, but never tasted grace the grace of God and salvation. He goes on to say, any response to the gospel that does not include obedience is a self-deception. If a profession of faith in Christ does not result in a changed life that hungers and thirsts for God's word and desires to obey that word, the profession is only that, a mere profession. James would go on to say, faith without works is dead, right? In the sense that 
our works of obedience to God are the evidences that we have saving faith. James ends this section in verses 23 through 25 with a very simple analogy. And we're going we're gonna to conclude with this. In verse 23, For if anyone is a hearer of the word of God and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. That is like looking in the mirror and then turning away from it and forgetting that you you got to do your hair before you come to church. <laughs> you got to you got to brush some things out over here. You got some crud over here, right? I mean, imagine right now if you just remembered that you forgot to make the changes that you saw in the mirror this morning. This would be like a mass exodus, right? It's kind of a silly thing to think about, this, this analogy. It's, it's simple, right? If you hear the word and you don't do it, you're like the guy that looks in the mirror and you don't make any changes at all. You forget what you see. Verse 25, but the one who looks intently at the perfect law. And the key word here is intently. The perfect law of liberty and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer. This man will be blessed in what he does. That's amazing to think about. Looking intently into the perfect law of liberty and not being a mere hearer, not just auditing. Oh, yeah, that's interesting stuff there. I wonder. I wonder where he found that little fact out. And, oh, that's kind of cool. I never knew that. But out the door we go and no change. But looking intently, looking intently into the perfect law of liberty, looking intently into the word of God that is able to transform your life, that is able to bring salvation to your soul. If you go out and do the word. Notice you are blessed in whatever you do. And that, that's interesting, right? You're blessed in whatever you do. Why? Because you're out doing the word. If you are a Christian, you are created in Christ Jesus for good works that he prepared for you to do in advance. Coming here week in, week out. Why do we do it? Well, God wants us to do it. This is what we've been doing since the beginning of the church. Gathering together, hearing the word of God, listening, responding, preparing our hearts, receiving the word, humbling ourselves, going out to do the work of the word. And this is the way in which the Christian must respond to hearing God's word, embracing it deep within his heart, cherishing it as his most prized possession, the value of the word of God in your heart, but also practicing it as a skilled craftsman who loves his trade. Amen. I pray that this was a help to you as it was to me. Let's go to the Lord and ask him for help. Lord God, we Come before you this morning, Lord, and just acknowledge our weakness, Lord. Confess to you, Lord, our often uh, indifferent hearts, Lord, uh, when it comes to hearing the word of God. And ask, Lord, that you would stir up our affections for you. Lord, help us to be a people who, Lord, are humble and contrite in spirit. Lord, help us to rid our hearts of all filthiness, Lord of the abundance of wickedness that would remain, Lord, in the flesh. Lord, let's welcome the word of God, Lord, I pray, as a dear friend coming to visit us in our home. Lord, let's receive the word, I pray. Lord, as a gardener 
planting the seeds into rich nutrient soil. And Lord, that we indeed would respond to your word, Lord. Help us. Lord, I pray if there are any here in our midst, Lord, who have yet to come to saving faith, that, Lord, that they would see, Lord, their desperate need for the cross. To think of the words of Jesus as he prayed, if there's any other way, but yet let your will be done. And we know that there was no other way for man to be reconciled to you, Lord, because Jesus indeed was crushed at the cross where he bore the sins of man, gave his own righteousness to all who would humbly come before him in faith. And so, Lord, I just ask for your help this morning. We love you, Lord. We praise you. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Okay, we're going to close.